presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Coming up, they're the first two women to anchor a national nightly news program, a conversation with Judy Woodruff and Gwen Eiffel of the PBS NewsHour about the goals and challenges for that award-winning show, which celebrated its 30th anniversary this year. That's Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Marcia Franklin. The PBS NewsHour recently announced that two of its longtime hosts, Judy Woodruff and Gwen Eiffel, would take over as co-hosts and managing editors of the NewsHour. The two are no strangers to Washington politics, having covered them for other networks and newspapers. Gwen Eiffel has been with the public broadcasting system since 1999, where she's also the moderator of Washington Week. Woodruff returned to the news hour in 2007, where she had been the chief Washington correspondent from 1983 to 1993. It's the first time two women have co-anchored a national nightly news program, but as you'll see in a moment, they don't think it's such a big deal. I had the opportunity to talk with the duo recently about their goals for the program. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me. I know there's both domestic news going on, what with the government shutdown and health care uh, acts starting up and international news with uh, Netanyahu addressing the world. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me. I, uh, I wanted to know right off the top, before we talk about the news hour, looking at the scene that we have in Washington, D.C. right now and your long coverage there, is this the most contentious you've seen it, Judy? Well, since I've been here the longest uh, of anybody probably in this newsroom, I'll start. Uh, I go back to the Carter administration in the late 1970s. And, you know, there was disagreement between the two political parties then. Democrats and Republicans disagreed all the time. They even had fights among themselves inside the parties. But I have to say, I've never seen it as distant, as acrimonious, as bitter at times as it is now. It's, it's really remarkable to me, as somebody who's been in this city for more than three decades, to see it, uh, to see the, the conversation stopped because the two sides uh, can't stand to be in the same room with one another. It's, it's, it's really, I think we've come to a place where the American people uh, need to pay close attention to what's happening. And Judy, how do you see your role as an anchor in parsing that situation because people get confused and sometimes, frankly, just tune out? Well, my role is simply to report on what's going on to, and to try to make it as, as clear and understandable as I can, to ask questions of the people who are making the news, uh, sometimes to talk to reporters who cover these stories day in and day out, whether it's health care, whether it's uh, international news, to try to make sense of it so that our audience uh, it has the benefit of the, the smartest, the best informed people we can find, and then the audience can make up their own minds. That, to me, is what our job is here. And Gwen, are you uh, feeling the same way that Judy is about the acrimony in Washington being at its height? Well, there's no question that it's pretty acrimonious right now. One of the interesting things for us is that we try to compare it to the things we've experienced before, whether it's previous shutdowns or previous gridlock episodes. And what seems to be different this time is that no one is dealing. Uh, the, they used to work out dif disagreements by coming up with a deal. So you get this, I get this. But what we now have is a, a population of lawmakers who aren't interested in dealing, who really there's nothing you can give them. And as a result, negotiations go nowhere. People get frustrated. Americans generally are, have so many things on their minds and their lives are so fractured, they don't pay attention until everything hits the wall. We're now at one of these points in Washington where everything is hitting the wall. So it, it seems like it's, we don't see a way out. Before we used to see these, stand, these kinds of uh, standoffs, it felt like we could see what the outcome would be. But there's no way to know it now. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty unique and difficult situation. And it's interesting for us, just as reporters and as people who try to explain this, to try to make sense of it to Americans who aren't watching it as closely as we do. And that's kind of our challenge every day. On a day like this, um, you've had some uh, preparation, some uh, uh, sense that this is going to happen. But nevertheless, what's a day like this like 
in the newsroom when all this news is breaking around you? Well, everybody is uh, is busy, engaged. We have a we have a, a pretty uh, tight staff here. We are we have every, everybody here has an assignment, and from the time we wake up in the morning, frankly, until we leave this place, and even after we get home at night. Uh, we know what our job is, and whether uh, it's, a, it's a news editor, whether it's a photographer, a videographer, a, a writer, somebody who's doing research, or somebody who's on the air, Gwen or me, we know we, we need to be very focused on what we're doing. There's no time to waste. And especially, as you said, on a day like this, when the government has just shut down at midnight, we're now 12, 13 hours into the shutdown, we've got the launch of the national health care law, which we've been anticipating for several years. We have international news with the Prime Minister of Israel speaking at the United Nations, as you mentioned. So there's, there couldn't be more news than there is, and everybody, it's all hands on deck. You know, one of the responsibilities for us, us Marsha, is that we don't think of ourselves as a Washington program. We think it's important to explain what's happening in Washington and outside of Washington for everyone else as well. So our responsibility is not only to say, why did Congress do this, but how does it affect your life in Idaho? How does it affect your life in Michigan? How does it affect your life in New Mexico? So we're always thinking in terms of how do we make this make sense to people who don't pay attention as closely. For us, it's also a 24-hour experience now. Our reporters and our producers were up all night trying to keep track of the latest for our website. We have a weekend program now, so we're seven days a week. We're thinking all the time about how to keep the story fresh and keep ahead of it, but not just the big stories, also a lot of things which might just be interesting to people, whether it's arts and culture, whether it's just a curiosity, uh, the panda cam. I'm heartbroken today because because of the shutdown <laughs> know, of the government, too. the panda cam has been cut off and we can't watch the baby pandas at the National Zoo. But we know that people are interested in a wide range of things and we want to take them beyond just politics in Washington. Well, maybe the children should storm the National Zoo the way the World War II veterans uh, broke into the World War II Memorial to get a chance to see it, even though it was shut down. I want to um, move on and talk a little bit. You, there's been no, no dearth of news, and even before you took over as uh, co-hosts and managing editors, you did a joint interview with President Obama regarding Syria. Then on the day that you began your co-hosting, Gwen, you had another interview with President Obama. Are these newsmaker interviews uh, going to be uh, a centerpiece uh, moving forward of the show, and do you take a personal interest in booking those yourself, Gwen? Yes, we, we do. We actually do think it's central to the program. We think people want to know more and not less about why decisions get made in Washington. I think the second time we showed up at the White House in two weeks, the president was like, are you back again? <laughs> we, we want to do what we can to talk to all the most important people making the most important decisions and then explain why we're doing it, because it has an effect on your life, not just for the, the vanity of it. And yeah, Judy and I have been reporters for a long time, so we don't hesitate getting on the phone, calling people up and saying, you got to talk to us. It's important that you talk to our audience and not for the ego of talking to them ourselves, but so that we can tell the story better. So we're hoping to raise the news hours profile even higher than it's already raised to make sure we tell those stories better. You mentioned the online component. Uh, that's, that's new in all of our careers, mine as well. Um, how hard is it to keep up with that side of it and how important is it to the news hour, Judy? Well, it's a fire hose of, of I, that's how I think of, of online. I mean, it is news coming at us 24-7. Uh, for somebody like me who's been around as long as I have, it's, it's been an adjustment. Fortunately, we have an amazing staff of people here who are mostly, in fact, all of them a lot younger than I am, who are much more comfortable with the web and with the technical aspects of the web. But for us, it's absolutely critical. You know, as Gwen just suggested, we are no longer a television show five nights a week. We're a television show now seven nights a week. Plus, we are online all the time, 24-7. We want our website, uh, pbs.org slash newshour, uh, to be a place you can go at any time to find out what the most important stories of the day are, to find out how they relate to you, and also to learn about some other interesting things that are happening uh, in the country and around the world. So, and that takes a team of dedicated people who are willing to put in some very long hours, as Gwen mentioned. We had people here virtually all night last night covering uh, Congress and uh, the, the government shutdown and what that was going to mean to the country. So it is a huge part of what we do at the news hour, and it's something we all embrace. 
Well, you mentioned a fire hose of information, but there's also a fire hose of sites. How do you distinguish yourself? How do you get people to make you their homepage or go to you for that breaking news instead of, say, uh, New York Times, MSNBC, any of the other plethora of sites? Well, we don't see ourselves as in direct competition with those sites. People are going to go for breaking news where they're going to go for breaking news. We're not a 24-hour cable network. We're not trying to churn out information all the time on the air. And, and the state sites you listed also have a huge broadcast component that never goes off. So it's a little bit different. We're trying to reach viewers in a different way. We're trying to get them we want to build on the audience we have, which we think is pretty smart, pretty educated, pretty curious. And then we want to spread on, build on that curiosity and also bring people in from public uh, broadcasting stations around the country who have those interests. So our job is to spread ourselves for a little bit thinner, a little bit wider for our audiences, but not try to compete with the breaking moment by moment news, even though we do have a new feature on our, on our website called The Rundown, where if that's your appetite and you want to know what's happening minute by minute, you're much more likely to get that kind of news. Every single week, every single month, I think you would you could look at our website, you could look at our program and see we evolve. We just constantly evolve into something else. And one more thing, I have to tell you something about Judy here. She's talking about how long she's been doing this and how <laughs> old she is, but you've never seen her rap. And, you know, I'm just telling you, she's got a little <laughs> hipster side to her that you've got to keep an eye out for. You know, and, and I would just, thanks a lot. <laughs> I would just add, though, that if you look at our website, what you're going to see, I think, are things that you won't find anywhere else. I mean, the work that Paul Salman and his team have been doing on what we call the Making Sense page, helping people understand, uh, you know, the older generation understand about the ramifications of retirement, about Social Security, but also about young people and their search for jobs. They have done some remarkable reporting there, and we've talked a lot about that. Uh, the reporting on our Art Beat page that Jeffrey Brown uh, and his team have, have pulled together is really some remarkable material, musicians, artists, dancers, and others. So it's a rich site. It's a site where you're going to learn a lot of things that you may not find anywhere else. Well, speaking of hipsters, Gwen, you've jumped into this <laughs> Twitter, Twitter stuff with... Uh, with both feet, uh, you're developing quite a personality on Twitter. <laughs> I think a few years ago, I Shh, don't think tell you anybody. said you weren't <laughs> you weren't sure you were going to do that. But uh, I enjoy following your tweets. What's that? What's that been like for you to not only take time from your day to do that, but also you know journalists typically are li have been a little bit removed from their audience, and now with with Twitter and Facebook. Well, you're, you're right. I'm a little bit of a Twitter fiend, but I was talked into it by a reporter from the Washington Post who said it was a great uh, way to find out what other people were thinking, to spread your understanding, but also to use it kind of as a curated news feed. I, I use Twitter as a way of following people I think are smart in all kinds of interesting areas, not just politics, but also in arts and also in people who are who just comment on the, the world, actors, actresses. I don't know. I have pretty broad interests. So Twitter allows me to tip into what they're saying and what they're doing sometimes way off the news but I find that if people are tweeting about what they had for lunch I don't have to follow them I don't have to listen to that <laughs> and they don't have to listen to me so I'm I, I try not to be more on Twitter than you would probably see on the air because I, I'm very responsible about what our, our goal is and what our responsibility is and that people aren't calling are, are following me on Twitter to hear me make snarky comments about everything I see on the other hand if Benjamin Netanyahu does a pun about yellow cake at the UN, I think it's worth sharing with the people who listen and follow me. And I loved your fist bump too. The two of you had. <laughs> on, yeah, we uh, can Twitter do that. that for we you. can do that for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's our trademark. <laughs> you should sign off with that. I think you need it. You need to do <laughs> Maybe that. not every night. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of uh, connecting with the audience, I know that um, you know much of much of the news coverage when. You two were um, selected to be the co-anchors and managing editors of the News Hour. Was that you were the first two women to do this? Um, there, there was a lot of congratulations on on Twitter uh, from people seeing this as a hallmark, a, a change. But you two, at least what I've read, don't necessarily see it as such a big deal. Well, I think I mean it's we're of two minds. I think I can kind of speak for Gwen, and then she's free to to add as she wishes. You know, on the one hand, it is exciting. It is the first time two women have co-anchored a national network newscast. So in one sense, it's a big deal. It is history. Uh, we've made some history here. On the other hand, we've been doing this a long time. It's a very natural thing for both of us. We've both been covering the news. Uh, I'm so lucky to work with someone, you know, it, 
with, like Gwen, who has the amazing experience she's had covering American politics, covering Washington, covering this country. Uh, and, and, and we feel it was just a natural progression. Uh, and, and we were both thrilled when, when the idea came along. Not because it was two women, but because this is an opportunity to bring to bear all of the work that we've done and the curiosity we bring, the love that we bring of the news, and frankly, uh, the, the passion that we have for the news hour. We think the news hour is a very special place, and to be able to work for it in this way is, is exciting. You know, when, when Judy and I, we've been, as you could tell, we've been doing this a little while in Washington, and there was a period of time when there were really only two women who were hosting News and Public Affairs program in Washington. When Judy was at CNN and I was here doing Washington Week at WATA, and we would run into each other, and we'd always be on those panels where they'd say, what's it like to be a woman? <laughs> and we became friends in that way and then started working here together. And what, it, what it's like for us is that we get up every day and do what women do, which is do the job and just show up and do and throw everything we have at it. What we found interesting since this announcement was made is that everybody else was so impressed by that and that I, to this day, weeks after we've started doing this, this lovely adventure we're on, is that young women in, in particular come, still come up to me and say how proud I am or how they teared up at seeing us for the first time. It's been uh, really amazing and kind of sends chills when you think about it that sometimes if you just do your job and you do it at the, the height of your craft and the best of your ability, that there are people who are taking something more from it than you just showing up and punching the clock every day. So we are both women who believe in supporting women and believe in nurturing women and bringing women along in our business especially, but in life. And so it's gratifying to be able to do what you love and also have, that, have this feed others as well as they watch you just doing your job. Was there any uh, talk of changing it to the Eiffel Woodruff News Hour or the Woodruff Eiffel News Hour, <laughs> the way it was with McNeil Lair? Maybe the Wood Woodruff Eiffel News Hour. That sounds good. <laughs> I think I like PBS News Hour. I think no, we'll, I think we'll we're just do that. Teasing. We're, we're going to stick. We like, we like PBS in there. PBS it, is making this possible. Enough change. We don't want to shock our viewers more than we have to. It's no secret that the News Hour has been having uh, budgetary concerns for quite a while and um, most recently this year had to ask PBS for additional money. It, actually, there was a Baltimore Sun uh, op-ed piece that said, you know, if we can't fund the news hour adequately, should we even have it? I hated that piece. I really <laughs> hated that piece. And I responded to the reporter in a way that made clear how much I hated it for this reason. We actually have always, always, always done more with less. This is a news organization that doesn't have the, both Judy and I have worked in commercial broadcast and we know what it's like to have resources. And we know that in public broadcasting, you don't always have them, but it doesn't mean that we're not doing the job. We're doing a different kind of program. We find a way to get around what we don't have. You know, you work in public broadcasting. It's what we all do, but we still think it's essential. And, it, it, and for us, we're not in this fractured environment now where we have, you know, a million cable channels and many of them with a point of view. We know that there is a, a slice of the audience. It doesn't have to be a broad slice, but enough of the audience which is engaged and wants to know a specific thing, but they want to know more about it. They want it in depth. They want responsibility, responsibility, and they want responsiveness, and they don't want us to tell them what they ought to think. They want us to tell them what they ought to know. And that's kind of what we do, and we do it the best of our ability with as little resources committed to it as possible. So does that mean that sometimes there's a crunch? Yeah, we're used to crunches around here. You would be surprised what we do on a day-to-day -day basis to make it work, but we still think it's essential to make it work. And we, we actually are pretty proud of how much we're getting done with how little. It's, it's pretty remarkable. I mean, I mentioned earlier, we've got a, maybe I didn't use these words, but we've got a pretty lean, mean machine here <laughs> with some people who put in some long hours. And, and as Gwen says, we know how to make a lot out of sometimes less, and that's the world of public broadcasting. It is, it's, it's tighter. The budgets are tighter. But you will not find a more dedicated group of news people. And I couldn't be more proud of what we do on the air every single night and what we put on our website online every single day and night. Um, I, I am, and I think there are, I don't know how many news organizations people can say that about, but that's how I feel about the place where I work. We're, we're pretty fierce mama bears <laughs> in defense of the news hour, and you can't and try to take us on. We'll always punch back. <laughs> 
You mentioned the weekend news hour. I don't want to uh, do this program without talking about that. I've worked with Hari on several pieces. Um, despite the budget problems, PBS has, has and WNET have come through with some money to start this. How, um, how important do you think that is to expand the news hour to seven days a week? And how are you going to be able to do it, again, with tight constraints? Well, it's very, it, it's very exciting. It's very meaningful to us, as both of us have mentioned, the fact that we are now on the air. We have an outlet seven nights a week. The news does keep happening through the weekend. It's been something I know the News Hour has thought about for a long time, and this opportunity came along because the folks who run WNET, the public station in New York, found that they had uh, some funds they could devote to a Saturday and a Sunday night show. It's, we, we call it the News Hour. It's a half-hour program. They had the resources. It was a natural fit. We worked very closely with Hari, uh, with his producers, his staff, and we view it, frankly, as an extension of us. They are on all of our morning planning calls. We know what they're doing. They know what we're doing. It's, it's frankly, expanding the platform and, I think, giving our audience even more to choose from. You mentioned reports that, that have been done about the news hour. That was one of the suggestions, that we should be a seven-day-a-week right. program. So what did we do? We've come up with a seven-day-a-week program. We're trying to find ways to continue to reach a broader audience, find a way to maybe tell the story a little bit differently, be a way to find a way to engage people who weren't there, who didn't think to find out that they need something they didn't know they needed on the weekend, at night, first thing in the morning with our morning line. Whatever we do, it's it's responding to our desires for how we want to tell the story, but also to we we take to heart any kinds of questions that are raised or needs that our viewers have most importantly for how they get their information. As we wrap up, a couple of final questions. How do you see the symbiosis between the two of you? How, your roles, where are your, your strengths, uh, each of you? Well, Gwen is a great reporter. I mean, she, uh, she cut her teeth in print working uh, for newspapers and, and then w worked at the network. Worked at, uh, she worked at the Washington Post, the New York Times, NBC News at a network before she came here. I'm a television baby. I've only worked in television. So I think she brings that. And by the way, I'm married to a newspaper guy. So, you know, <laughs> I think it's good to have some association with print people. But seriously, so Gwen brings that amazing reporting background. I bring a background of reporting as well, but, but a television and principally Washington background. So I think, you know, and we're just different personalities. Yeah. I mean, Gwen is Gwen. She's a shy, quiet, retiring. Yeah, right. Nobody ever sees me coming. <laughs> no, I think you, it's, and that's important, though. We see the world the same. We see yeah. journalism the same. But we are both basically kind of different people, which I think is part of the value. We come from different backgrounds. We bring different instincts. Sometimes we sit in a story, a story conference and someone will come up with a great idea that I wouldn't have thought of because it was not part of my natural experience. That's what makes journalism and that's what diversity is truly about, diversity of background and experience and interest. And to the extent that we can combine that, not just with the two of us, but also Margaret Warner brings a different set of background and interest. Jeffrey Brown brings more. Ray Suarez brings more, Hari Sridhar brings more, and when you put us together, we have such a breadth of instinct that I think that makes for a better and different kind of program. So Judy and I are just the tip of the spear. We did have a question from a viewer on Facebook who wanted to know if either of you get nervous when you do your interviews, uh, having to ask the tough questions. She said, in her in her thought, uh, could be nerve wracking at times. I will confess, I was a little nervous before we interviewed the president a few weeks ago. That was a big moment. He there was a lot going on. Uh, with regard to Syria, uh, there were, uh, you know, anytime you sit down with the president, anybody of that, uh, at that level, if you're not nervous, there's something wrong with you. I, my, my most nervous moment was just before the, the, the vice presidential debate in 2008 when everybody was so crazy about Sarah Palin and Joe Biden and what was going to happen. And I've been pretty cool right until five minutes before I walked out. Then I thought, oh, my goodness, 67 million people will be watching, <laughs> mostly my back, but still. And I got nervous, really nervous for about five minutes and then turned it off and was able to go out and do the job. So, yeah, sometimes that provides you with a little bit of energy to get through the question and get to the other side. Nerves can be a good thing. Yeah. Well, I've had the opportunity and the privilege to interview both uh, Robin McNeil and Jim Lehrer, and, and uh, Mr. Lehrer did tell me that if you're not nervous, something's wrong. You need to have that, <laughs> a little bit of that. And speaking of that, he has those guidelines, um, which we talked about in our interview, his, his journalism guidelines, and I'll post those on our website. Um, do you uh, take a look at those? Do you have your own 
that you have in the newsroom? Jim is our, gu our lodestar here, still. We go follow his instincts, we follow his, his sensibilities about what news is and how you cover news. We wouldn't be here if we didn't agree with them. And as a result, it kind of, I think, it, I think it, cover it, it, what's the word, infiltrates everything we do. I think that one of the one of our favorite sayings of Jim's is, is I probably won't get this right now that I'm going to try to repeat it, but it's something like when we wake up in the morning, all we have to think we don't have to think about who we are as a news organization and, and how we do the news and what, what we believe is our news philosophy. All we have to think about is what are we going to cover? because we know who we are and what we stand for. Um, I think we all find that a, a very useful and meaningful uh, uh, motto to live by. And finally, when young people who want to go into journalism talk to you, what kind of advice do you give them? I tell them to write. No, no, that's, no. A, that's a joke. <laughs> um, I tell young people that they need to know how to write, that they need to know how to ask questions and think about what the answers might be for me before they pose the question. I want them to think that this is more than just showing up in front of a camera. I want them to think it's more than just talking and describing what you see behind you, that you actually have a responsibility to tell a story well. And you never can tell a story well if you're not curious and if you can't write and communicate it. And I find that that usually draws the line between people who want to be in television and people who want to be journalists. People who want to be journalists do want to learn how to write and have curiosity and people who just want to be in television and really usually respond by saying really that sounds hard they're not the people I invest my time in <laughs> yeah I mean Gwen put it very well it's you know you say to them you know be prepared to work really hard there you you are on the job all the time you're never not a reporter if you're a reporter and that curiosity is absolutely essential if you're not really curious about the world around you if you're not interested in a lot of things uh, maybe this isn't the field for you. But you know what, it's, I, I find, I've, I've never found, a, I've never been able to, to discourage if a young person's interested and they've got the, they've got that, that, you know, that be they're determined to go into reporting, by all means go after it. And even if the jobs look like they're scarce and you hear all these scare stories about what's happening to journalism, go for it because there will always, people will always need information. They'll always want to know what's going on. And if you're a reporter, you can help them understand that. We're always going to need people like that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. There's never a boring day in news. Today is no exception. And I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to talk with me and by proxy our viewers. And since this is not the news hour, it is dialogue, you can do a fist bump, yes? Yes, sure. we can. Yeah, we can. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Marsha. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. That's all the time we have. You've been listening to Gwen Eiffel and Judy Woodruff, the co-hosts and managing editors of the PBS NewsHour. For more information on the program, including Judy and Gwen's Twitter handles, check out the Dialogue website. That's also where you find links to the interviews I've done with Jim Lehrer and Robin McNeil, the founders of the NewsHour. Just go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho.